in the interests of, of time, certainly um, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and do our introductory remarks while we're waiting for a couple more folks to be on board. Um, thank you very much for being here. Hello and welcome. Um, we're very pleased to be hosting this session for the Edmonton Arts and Festivals community to touch base with us and the city leadership. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I see many faces uh, and names that I know here. And although I'm somewhat saddened that we can't meet in person, I'm very glad that you're here with us today. I sincerely hope you are all safe and healthy. Um, I'm told that the mayor is online now. We are joined today by Mayor Don Iveson and our expecting city councillors, uh, including Scott McKean, who I know is online, and probably Sarah, Sarah Hamilton and uh, Ben Henderson as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I just can't get my camera turned on. It won't let me turn my camera on. Mm. We've had some real technical difficulties yeah. this morning with GoToMeeting. Sorry. Okay, so we've got we've got Councillor Henderson and Councillor Hamilton online. That's great. Um, also on the call are a number of EAC board members who I see, and, including our chair, Mr. Noel Xavier, and uh, the EAC's executive director, Sanjay Shahani. Uh, my name is Stephen Williams. Um, most of you know me, I think. I'm the EAC's grants director, and I'll be moderating the conversation today. Um, this is the second of two sessions. The other was on Friday uh, with a different group of attendees and a different group of speakers. Both of these sessions uh, are being recorded and will be available soon with closed captioning so we can be as accessible as possible. The Friday session recording also has an ASL interpreter, which we were um, regrettably unable to make happen for today's uh, live stream. There are between 50 and 60 people online. And so you will note that we're uh, muting everybody. Uh, we ask you to stay muted to keep the sound levels manageable. Uh, momentarily, I'm going to ask Sanjay, uh, the mayor, um, uh, to offer some opening remarks. And then we're going to have uh, three invited members of our community to offer their perspective on the current situation and the potential futures that they see. Um, this includes Nisha Patel, who is our city poet laureate and director of the Edmonton Poetry Festival, uh, Sherry Somerville from Ballet Edmonton, and Chantelle Gosh, who is the uh, ED at the Citadel Theatre. They're each going to have sort of uh, a few minutes to, uh, to present what they are experiencing currently, what they've experienced over the last six weeks, and maybe, maybe some ideas they have for the future. And then we'll be inviting the mayor and councillors to um, ask them some questions uh, as that goes which will then lead into a little bit more of a discussion portion of the meeting later if you have a topic that you think would add to the discussion so please use the text chat function that is um, uh, embedded in the go to meeting uh, process uh, I will be watching along with some other EAC staff, we'll be watching the chat and we're gonna do our best to identify some topics and questions that we can insert into the conversation. Um, there's a lot of us, so probably we're not going to be able to address everything that everybody would like to. Um, we know and have experienced certainly that everyone's crystal balls are a bit cloudy these days. And so we recognize that no one has all the answers. This is a continually evolving situation, and therefore I'm just going to encourage us to remember to be gentle with each other um, in this meeting and hopefully in our lives in general. So with that, I'm going to invite Sanjay to uh, offer some opening remarks and then he can invite the mayor. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for turning up in such uh, great numbers. We had, a, we had a great meeting on Friday too. Um, so I, I want to start by actually also welcoming uh, a, a few people who have uh, taken time off, uh, you know, their, their busy lives. So of course, Mayor Iverson, uh, Councillors Henderson, Hamilton and McKean. Thank you very much again for, uh, for, for uh, making this happen and for uh, uh, having, having the opportunity for our for our community to have a, a dialogue with you, we know that this is not the first or the last one. We probably will hopefully have uh, more as things brighten and we get into summer. Hopefully, some of the 
some of the fuzziness that Stephen talked about in terms of our work will have lifted and we will be thinking about new plans to move ahead. I also want to acknowledge uh, our board, uh, the EAC board. There's a number of uh, EAC board members, uh, including our chair, Noel Xavier, who is online. So I want to thank them for attending. Uh, there were a number of you also present on Friday. And then finally, I would also like to uh, you know, welcome the EAC's partners in Connections and Exchanges. We have David Ridley from the Edmonton Heritage Council, and we have Julian Main from Arts Habitat Edmonton. So, so thank you for coming. Um, and then I, you know, at, at the very at, at the very least, because this is your meeting with with our mayor and our councillors, I don't want to take too much time. I just want to say that uh, the EAC has been working hard, and we will continue working hard uh, on on your behalf. And um, even if it looks a bit uncertain and fuzzy and gloomy, I know that we'll come together and 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 pull out of this stronger and more resilient. That's the goal. Uh, so with that, I want to actually hand it over to Mayor Iverson to give his opening remarks. It says I can turn my camera on. There we go. Fantastic. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's nice to see some of you, those of you who are allowed to turn your microphones on. I uh, want to uh, thank uh, Councillors Henderson, McKean, and Hamilton for uh, making time for this. We had a illuminating conversation on uh, on well last week whichever day it was everything's a bit fuzzy I don't know about you what day of the week is which but uh, uh, you know and we're all adapting though many in the arts have been working from home for years my uh, my dad was a sculptor and uh, kind of primary caregiver to me when I was a kid because he worked from home and so uh, I guess it's back to the future for some of us uh, this big chunk of cardboard behind me is my new standing desk which uh, the good folks from uh, Ikea delivered this morning, so I'm going to get my uh, temporary workspace here a little more ship shape because uh, we may be in this new mode for a while, notwithstanding the excitement uh, that came last week from uh, announcements that things will start to ease. I think easing back to something that would look familiar to all of us may be a, a ways off yet. Um, and that obviously has profound implications for all of our lives. It has profound implications for for our economy, uh, but it has profound implications for culture and how we gather, um, how we celebrate, uh, how, we, how we exchange uh, knowledge and perspective. Um, in the arts in particular. And so um, it's been on my mind and, and I've had a lot of uh, uh, individual conversations with leaders of organizations in our city that have been affected by this, by this change and who have at this point more questions than answers, but, but also have undertaken um, innovative decisions, uh, very difficult decisions about cancellation of events, um, but also hopefully seen the, the beginnings of the resiliency of our recovery from this, which includes, you know, philanthropic support and, and audience support and sponsors hanging in there. Um, but it is going to be difficult. No doubt it's going to be very, very difficult uh, uh, to get through this summer for sure. And, uh, you know, I think we have to prepare ourselves for the possibility that it could be more than one season that is uh, uh, disrupted, it, almost certainly to some degree, uh, next season will be disrupted. It's just that uncertainty is really unhelpful for planning purposes. But the main thing I want to communicate to, to all of you here today is that the city of Edmonton didn't come this far uh, on arts and culture over the last 10 years or so uh, to look, to turn back. Um, I think, uh, you know, our investments in the arts, um, both on the facility side and on the program side, um, we want to see continue to pay dividends into the future and and for the arts to be part of to continue to be part of the resiliency of this city you know the the festival scene was was part of the way this city um coped with the downturn in the 80s and so absolutely the arts need to be part of um, the vibrancy of our rebound and um while we're coping here in this altered state uh, need to be part of our resiliency as well. And so um, so for the content that's been produced lately, thank you for that which will be produced innovatively in the short to medium term, thank you. And for hanging in there with us and we'll have your backs uh, for the long term, thank you. 
So I'll uh, I'll leave it there because I'm really interested more to hear what you all have to say. And sorry I was late. I had the uh, had the link to last week's in my calendar. So apologies for the, the late start. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just so that everybody knows, apparently we have some limited bandwidth issues here. So if you're not going to be speaking, um, I, we'd be grateful if you'd uh, turn off the camera with the potential exception of the camera that has the baby on it. That's awesome. Um, so <laughs> I can, oh, there we go. I can turn my camera on again. Thanks. So at, at this point, I'm going to invite uh, Nisha Patel, the city's poet laureate, to, to bring a few words um, about her experience and, uh, and how this uh, situation has impacted the uh, Edmonton Poetry Festival. Nisha? Can Nisha hear me? Thanks, Stephen. Uh, yeah, so I think things have been cool. I think things have been, um, I hate to say interesting, uh, since I'm supposed to know so many more words, but things have been interesting to deal with. And I think what we're hearing from so many different people is that there's a lot of factors to take into account. So as an organizer um, of the festival, it's been hard to see so many challenges come up that we don't always have the financial resources to deal with and so one thing we've had to do is like let staff go uh, or reduce hours quite significantly just because we didn't have the revenue coming in for us uh, that usually happens we've also had to really backtrack with donors and with other people who are funders for the festival and wonder which funds we can reallocate to the transition that we're going through right now and which funds are essentially lost to us to access you know not everyone wants to fund the organizational structure of a festival they want to fund events. At the same time, a lot of grants rely on audience numbers and on event planning in order for future funds to come in. And without these events happening right now, or with drastically reduced audience participation, we're now looking at shortfalls in the future for how our grants are going to be affected. And not all the grants include the ones from the Arts Council, but some federal grants like that. And I think we're all dealing with a lot of information not really coming out. And so obviously these really big organizations are dealing with change themselves and the information will come down the pipe eventually. But that in itself as an organizer has been incredibly difficult for us to deal with the uncertainty itself. Um, on top of that, we feel that our audiences might not recover from this, you know, we might not be able to bounce back to a place we were at before. So it's unrealistic for us to expect that any sort of gradual resurgence of events is going to lead to the same buildup. Many of us took years and years to build up our audiences and build up our event space into what they are today. And what we're seeing is a total realignment of how these events happen and what's going to happen for us in the future. Some of the things we're hearing from artists and things that I've experienced myself as a working artist is that we don't necessarily qualify for aid packages because we have what some will call really lumpy incomes. So there's months where we'll make half our income for the year through grants and other sort of mechanisms and months where we make nothing. And so it's really hard to qualify for some of these really big overarching aid packages because they haven't been taken into account for our industry and the type of work that we do. For many of us who are contractors or work on a contract basis, we didn't have stuff like benefits um, and some of us were not even able to pay into stuff like EI in the first place because there's so much misinformation and so little resources for us to access this type of stuff. And so it's been a really big challenge on the personal front as well. Now that we're hearing that there's a wage subsidy as well, um, even then, there's a lot of like there's a lot of uncertainty whether people with grant income can even apply for that, and so that in itself has also been an issue um, where we just don't know. And so there's a lot of people who've been really negatively affected. Obviously, everyone's been negatively impacted, but there's so much uncertainty going into the future that we don't know what we can deliver. We don't know what people want. Um, I don't know if you guys have been noticing as well. There's also been this like huge uptick in content being produced right there's so many events now and for artists who have even even a small marginally uh national network what we're seeing is that we're invited to everything you know there's so much going on and we don't have the capacity to take it all in and so that's been contributing as well because everyone is now trying to get kind of the same market share you know we're trying to get that online content going and then personally as an artist um 
I don't know about everyone else, but it has been very difficult to write during these times. It's been very difficult to produce. And so aid packages that are tied to artistic creation are huge challenges for us. You know, we are undergoing a pandemic the same as other industries. Um, at the same time, we're not getting aid. At the same time, we're asked to produce a lot of content, a lot of work under these really challenging circumstances. So. Those are some of the concerns that I have that I wanted to voice today, um, both as an organizer of events and as an artist myself working in these events. I've seen a lot of stuff kind of fall back and stuff kind of grow in different places. So, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, stop it right there. Thank you, Nisha. Um, ben Henderson or Sarah yeah. Hamilton. Yeah, quick quick question. Um, with the with the online. Um, uh, projects that you're doing are is there do they have any kind of monetary is there any remuneration that's going with them or is that the expectation that that's all free content yeah so um some of the funds that have been allocated have really varied so some online gigs have paid much less than usual um, and some of them have paid much more in order to make up for kind of the loss of gig income. And so honestly, it just varies on what the organization is, who has the funds, um, who is like tapping into endowments and stuff like that. Uh, that's really what determines how much you're going to get paid. And then uh, just another quick question, obviously, in terms of what we do with future future grants and how we how we adjudicate things like um, uh, like how much you spent this year, some of those formulaic pieces. I mean, obviously Arts Council can adapt to that, but are you hearing anything from your other, other orders of government and other funders around what they're going to do in the future around the fact that nobody's going to have audience numbers for this year and, and that, their, that their, uh, their expense numbers are going to be way down? I think it's just tough because like I said, we all have the same information that we're dealing with. And so even though there, even when there is kind of like aid or funding being put into place, we don't know how long it's going to be put into place. Okay. So many of us are simultaneously planning for future closure as well as present day activity. Right, great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Not seeing Councillor Hamilton wanting to redirect, I think I'll uh, I'll uh, invite uh, Sherry Somerville to uh, offer her comments from her perspective as uh, the executive director at Ballet Edmonton. Well, thanks everybody. It's so nice to get together. I I'm reading, so I won't uh, bother being on camera. Um, like many organizations, the abrupt end to our season uh, dealt a massive financial blow to us as we were forced to cancel all our primary fundraisers and our summer intensive, which generates for us about 60% of our operating budget. We used the remaining cash we had on hand to pay out our contract artists rather than abandon them at a time when they had no alternatives for living and I laid off the only other part-time employee we had. Ballet Edmonton employs our artists for 30 weeks each season, and they are all contract workers, not employees. So although I am relieved that CERB was an option for our dancers through the summer, uh, it is not designed to help Ballet Edmonton meet our payroll in September, and we do not qualify for any of the retro retroactive reimbursements for anyone but me. So CERB is not helpful in a significant way for companies like ours that have 95% contract artists on payroll. Our entire arts operating grant, to give you some perspective, councillors and, and Mr. Mayor, would cover one month of our artistic payroll. So my biggest concern is not how do we limp to the fall, but how do we move into the fall with a season that is supposed to resume even understanding that we must be prepared to adapt our expectations. We all understand adaptation is essential. Um, conducting a recovery campaign right now at a time when many of our patrons are themselves suffering is impractical and to a certain extent, uh, a little tone deaf or unethical when people and businesses are struggling to financially meet their own needs and tend to their own survival. So our current funding models in Alberta require us to raise, let's say, 75% of our revenue from public, publicly derived sources like donations, sponsorships, fundraisers, tickets, etc. So when there is an absence of gathering, an absence of events, 
and massive unemployment in, in the private and public sector. I would love to know how um, the city and the EAC vision the art sector recovery being realistically addressed and realistically unfolded or, or uh, impacted, rolled out, sorry. So will the city support the EAC to cre create an arts recovery team made up of some leaders to cultivate a realistic recovery plan to uh, then recommend back to the city and the EAC so we don't see a sector collapse? Is the city willing to consider some COVID recovery aid packages to stabilize organizations in the short term who have models that simply can't be suspended? So I'll give you an example. We're a ballet company. I can't just say to my dancers, you guys you have to fend for yourselves this year. I'll see you next year. Uh, ballet dancers who don't dance for six months aren't ballet dancers anymore, let alone a year. So it is our obligation as an ensemble-based company to preside, provide them with the technical training and the studio uh, and all the equipment that we need to make sure that they can still dance to the level that we expect them to dance when we are ready to resume. So that is one example, and I'm, I know many of you have your own examples of uniqueness in the organization. So I think that we don't need a recovery plan that is a one-size-fits-all. We need a creative recovery plan that addresses organizations. There aren't so many of us that we can't do that. Um, so COVID-19, of course, has uh, prompted the big, bigger questions to be explored. So what is the city of Edmonton's position on the possible collapse of our arts ecosystem? Is it practical for the city to help the EAC help us survive and adapt to the coming year or two? And what will the messaging be to the public in the fall about arts attendance? I know that that's maybe tricky, but I wonder if there is um, a strategy at the city to encourage people to make their way back to arts. I realize these are all complex questions and we can't answer them all today, but those are my thoughts. Uh, redirect uh, Councillor Hamilton or Councillor Henderson or the mayor. I think the mayor wants to weigh in, it looks like. Sure. I'm happy to make comments, but I think they all want to weigh in. Yeah, I, I thanks for that, Sherry. I mean, um, I think understanding uh, where the gaps are in bearing in mind that uh, the city of Edmonton has about eight cents of everybody's tax dollar, give or take, uh, and that unlike the feds who can print money and the province, which notwithstanding what, what they're saying, uh, has more fiscal room than any other province uh, to borrow and, and deficit finance uh, recovery, um, the, city's, the city's in a very challenged position. Uh, we're down 4,100 jobs ourselves uh and um anticipating revenue impairment of between 90 million and 260 million depending on uh how how this plays out so that has really um tied our hands in many respects um we have been able to move some resources around to provide uh relief to uh business to the tune of about um 11 million in tax shifting last week which you may have read about um, and to the extent some of you are non-residential uh, property tax payers in your venues uh, depending on the nature of your tenancy that that may provide a tiny bit of relief for you uh, but um, uh, we've we've also set aside 10 million dollars for economic development um, initiatives and related to recovery uh, some of that will be deployed in partnership with our um, uh, business improvement areas uh, who are also partners in some of the major cultural parts of the city, downtown Alberta Avenue and Old Strathcona in particular, uh, also 124th uh, uh, and, and Stoning Plain to, to a degree as well. So we might be able to look at an arts lens on some of, uh, on some of those economic development and business revitalization initiatives. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, even that uh, 10 million on top of the 11 in tax relief is really a drop in the bucket compared to uh, the kind of support that households and organizations, both for-profit and not-for-profit, including cultural need, 
And so I, th I do think the city clearly plays a role. And uh, as I alluded to, I think our first role is stability of the funding to EAC and then and then uh, support for EAC reprofiling those dollars and adjusting those formulas uh, that uh, Misha was alluding to. And I think that's already started to happen. As for sort of an additional investment, I think, you know, one of the reasons that we have called for the federal and provincial governments to backstop our losses is so that we can then turn around and support relief. So I think, to be honest, the main answer, the first answer is we're going to have to work hard uh, to advocate for that from the orders of government that have the resources while remaining committed to the resources that we have in place through EAC. And then if we can, um, either through support that flows through the city um, from senior orders of government uh, or through some of these other business initiatives free up some additional support i think we need to look at that clearly that's got to be uh, we don't want to lose these institutions and these assets um, and i think the other point would be and this is something uh, we're, we're working on sort of around a different table is uh, philanthropic support uh, through the community foundation and other institutions to be able to establish uh, some major dollars to support rebound um, and long-term uh, resiliency as well. So I think that there is there is a philanthropic piece to this as well that uh, you can all go after individually, which, as Jerry said, you know that's potentially tone deaf right now. But if it's part of a larger coordinated re recovery and resiliency initiative that includes the arts as a core value for the city, as well as making sure the food bank and windhouse and the other um, not-for-profit organizations that we rely on in the city, that if everyone's in a larger strategy, I think it's easier to make the broader ask and then to know that uh, uh, arts and culture will benefit as well. So those are those are kind of my initial reactions to a very sober take, but uh, I'd, I'd look to my colleagues for some supplemental. Um, well, I, I, the one thing that strikes me, Sherry, and it's I think your suggestion about a about a kind of recovery team, because I I think you're absolutely right. It's not going to be a one size fits all. I mean, I'm, the, the the piece of your story that's really striking me, which is new, um, and I suspect isn't particular to dance companies. Um, I'm guessing there's some others in a slightly similar situation, but hasn't been part of the story we've been hearing so far. Is that you weren't in a situation where you could walk away from your company um you, the, the people that you know that you needed to be able to keep them going i that hasn't been the story we've been hearing from others they've been able to ramp down somewhat um but i you know so i don't i i think it's 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 why this is really useful to hear all these stories because they're all the challenges are a bit different for each one of them and i and i think the idea maybe this is a challenge back to the arts council um uh, you know, and I, I sit on that board now. So is to really think about that kind of recovery team, understanding that everybody's situation is going to be different. Because I, I think we have, you know, as I said to the group on Friday, I think we've got two issues here right now. And we need to focus on both. One is how we don't lose people over the next shorter period. And then two is what, how we make sure people can bounce back and get back to it in the longer period. Those are our challenges right now. And I, and I, uh, you know, I think we have to put equal weight on both of them. I think the answers to do both of those things are probably different um, and will be different for different organizations. So, I mean, hearing your story. So I'm just curious, do you, um, are the dancers, is the studio still available for the dancers? Are they still doing class? Yeah, it has been. I continue to pay rent there um, and uh, to give them a space to be in. Yeah. And then we just book time and they could go in. Some of them there, we have a couple, okay. you know, some of them have it, live in the same building and we're self-isolated right. to be safe, to be able to work together. But they weren't yeah. together as a cluster. Um, so, but we definitely, right. you know, and that is my concern is I've got to keep the studio available for them. Yeah, so Here, no, I know. And I, you know, I'm not sure everybody's been in quite that same boat. So that's really, it's really helpful to hear. And I, you know, because it's another perspective on this, it's been slightly okay. different than the stories we've had. Do that by ensuring this blue button. Whoops. Great. Good. Thank well, you. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sarah, did you have? Um, I just, I mean, uh, I won't, I think you and the mayor addressed a lot of the questions Sherry asked, but one of the things I think worth addressing is the question of what happens when we start to, how do we spread the message once we start to get into recovery? And I think, um, Sherry, a lot of people have a role in that, but as we're seeing right now, 
as measures are relaxed, there is a lot of confusion about what the boundaries are. Um, you see people going to parks in New York City and hanging out there and at the same time abject horror that people would even think about going to parks right now. And the messaging from public health officials hasn't been really clear. I think something that we can do is help and we'll be able to navigate a little better through the summer is to clarify um, uh, that kind of messaging so at least people can feel comfortable going to a, an arts event of some sort. And I mean, the unknown for us at this time and for all of us really is what conditions look like in September or October. Um, so are we back in this um, state with stay at home orders? Do we stay at that phase one, phase two um, space? That uh, I think we have to gauge our messaging on that. But right now what I'm seeing is a lot of reservation about people even being like, in the vicinity of other people. And I don't think that goes away. So I think part of our responsibility is to explain that like being in an art gallery or a museum and and is, is part of, a, there's a healthy way to enjoy that or there's a healthy way to enjoy um, going to see a performance um, because of that confusion and anxiety is really present right now. But I, you know, I think people will need those experiences, especially in the fall. Well, and I think there is a difference between a, an art gallery and a museum and the confined space of live theater where they're back to back, side to side. So we, we definitely understand, I, I think Chantel will probably speak to that as well. We understand the restrictions and the limitations, but um, we still need to find a way to move forward uh, other than just waiting and firing everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think that's part of what this feedback helps inform because you're cert I think we heard of this on Friday as well. Yeah, great, thank you. I, I see Councillor McKean has turned his camera on. Is that a signal that you wanted to say something? Well, I, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I just wanna join my colleagues in, um, and I know Chantelle has yet to speak and I'll be keen to hear her point of view too, but it's very, um, very sobering. We've certainly heard from uh, the business community and from uh, our constituents about what they're going through. Um, so this is not <clears throat> is not an uplifting story. <clears throat> I can tell you that I received one email today of congratulations from a uh, someone more aligned with the corporate sector that this you know city council is looking after the essentials and. Um, and, and cutting everything else. And I responded by saying, well, we all have different definitions of what is essential. And I think um, our community is going to need its arts and cultural and music communities more than ever as we come out of this. So um, I don't know what the answers are specifically, but I think I our advocates here um, I don't know whose phone that was, was mine. Uh, no, was you have strong advocates here. And, um, and, um, and, and we, we will need your support as well. We will need your stories and your data to support our decisions in the future as well. So I'll stop there, but thank you. Okay, I, just so that everybody knows, I, I am monitoring the uh, the chat. Um, I notice a few people echoing uh, Sherry's comments um, and Nisha's comments as well. Uh, Councillor Henderson, just to uh, clarify, there are some other organizations that are in the same position as Ballet Edmonton, um, specifically the Edmonton Symphony, who you know you, it's difficult to walk away from those contractors that are uh, that are full time artists in our community. Um, there are also a couple of questions that have been sent to me privately, specifically about um, festival organizations. Um, I will put in my two cents that uh, we're thinking about that at the Edmonton Arts Council, trying to figure out ways to support folks, whether they need to um, cancel outright or re, 
rethink how this year's festival goes um, and that will be things that we need to do in conjunction with our board and with the uh, with the advisors that we uh, work with from the community uh, in the meantime for now uh, if there are other topics that you want to bring up please do put them in the chat and uh, I am going to invite uh, Chantal to uh, to offer her perspective Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the mayor and the council members and our friends at the EAC for putting this together. Uh, as we've worked through some of these challenges over the last weeks, and I've talked to colleagues and in other places, and particularly in the US, I tell you, I am incredibly grateful to be in this city right now and in this country. Um, and I know that you're facing lots of difficult decisions as we all are, and certainly my colleagues on this call are. Um, Every time I think I'm going to make what is the biggest, most awful decision I've had to make, it's like 15 minutes goes by and there's a new one that puts the other one you know, to, to shame. So uh, I know that there's a great yawning chasm of need in so many sectors and uh, I, I thank you for your time and for considering the arts. So um, I don't um, belabor our, our sad statistics too much. I think we all kind of know what they are. Um, when we shut down, it impacted six performances, six shows at the Citadel, three main stage performances. Um, two of our musical performances and one of our high wire performances. And that was to the tune of about $1.1 million in tickets. Um, it also impacted our school, our summer camps, our spring camps, our young companies. Um, some of those things we've been able to um, recapture into online formats that are working surprisingly well and giving us great hope for the future and how to serve underserved communities who aren't in our geography. So there's a, a, a nice uh, highlight, but it also impacted our tenants. We have two other theater companies, three restaurants and a dentist in our building, all whom are unable to contribute towards any of the cost of our facility. Um, so we had an instant hard stop of our cliff falling off of revenue and our expenses given we have a very large building um, to keep going to keeping going we released 122 people um, now some of them are employees some of them were union members some of them were contractors we we work in a bunch of different ways with um, with people so it depends on that we are working really hard to try and bring some of them back under the wage subsidy program now that we've seen who can uh, who is eligible, who isn't, and that kind of thing. Um, not because we have work for them to do, but because we are trying to support them in the best way we can and um, to ensure that we protect the talent in our industry so that they are there when hopefully we can rise again, um, Lazarus ourselves out of this. So right now we are working on a bunch of different scenarios. And I think um, I echo what some of the, the concerns are from others in that this is an elastic of unknown uncertainty of how long this will be. Uh, the Citadel is positioned to, to be able to produce art. Um, we're very lucky in that our founders invested in an endowment and you know, we have the ability to survive catastrophe, but unfortunately it's that bridging time in between. Um, if is it six months, is it a year and a half? Uh, and what decisions do you make to steward your resources in the best way? Right now, this couldn't have happened at a worse time because we were right at the point, because of our planning cycle, we were in the point in our season where we spent all our money for next season, like made big investments for next season. We haven't made any money off of this season and then everything stopped. So currently every dollar we spend is a debt dollar for us. We're into our line of credit. So what a big thing for us, frankly, is to be able to preserve enough of those resources in that debt financing to be able to start our programming. We spent six weeks unprogrammed. I said it was like a conscious uncoupling of us and our programming. Um, and now we're thinking about what's our 60 day plan once we know. Now, regardless of all of that, our subscriptions, we usually, this is the time of year we get about 80% of our subscriptions in and we are looking to be at 40 to 50% of where we need to be because of all the reasons you'd expect. Um, uncertainty in terms of what's going to happen, economic uncertainty and that kind of thing. So. We're working, we're working on that, but right now I'm focused on keeping my team as whole as possible, making sure that their their mental health is is there, making sure they have the supports and resources, making sure they have the physical health um, that we can regather again and take care take care of each other in the meantime um, and create a bit of a lifeboat wherever we can. So from a future state, and we're doing a lot of things um, online because that's where we all live now. And I'm looking at this wonderful, I call it the QWERTY board of, it looks like a QWERTY keyboard of artistic awesomeness. And all of you not on your cameras, I'm gonna assume you're victims of home haircuts. So you're, you're, you're really great looking in my mind. Um, 
So our school programming, we have all of our spring classes have gone forward online, which is amazing. And I think partly because parents are at home with their children and quite frankly, anyone could be putting anything online to keep them occupied for a bit so they can work, but it's working for us. Um, and we're looking at how do we deal with the new reality because no matter what our health, you know, the, our health officer says, no matter what the government says about opening up is that we've got some very significant barriers to people wanting to come shoulder to shoulder with 700 of their brethren anytime soon. So we have an internal task force looking at um, all of the different ways people interact with our space and our processes and trying to mitigate risk, trying to look at renovations, that kind of thing. We're looking at streaming, which um, has a lot of implications from a royalties and union standpoint. And we are treating our patrons' um, challenges as an accessibility issue. So those, particularly if you're talking about people who are seniors or who are, have, are immune compromised, how do we meet their needs? In, like they're, it's an accessibility issue. So we're, we're working for that. And, and if I was looking for help and hope, hopes uh, would be, infrastructure around you know dealing with refund issue from that's a big issue if we had to refund everybody their tickets and subscriptions at this point it would bring us to our knees and a local coordinated effort around messaging and around the same approach across hospitality and venue management to make people feel safe and comfortable our first patrons are going to be edmontonians from a tourism standpoint let's get them out so messaging and building a bridge to the recovery is our really big points of trying to get there i guess Thank you, Chantal. Uh, Councillors or the mayor? Uh, sure. I'm. I'll ask. I'm, one of the things I'm interested in, Chantal, is uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask a sort of hopeful question, I guess, in terms of going, you know, turning it all back on again. Um, you know, obviously we don't know when, so that's the unhelpful part of this. Um, but you know, what, you know, what kind of how do how are you how do you imagine dealing with the risk of knowing when to turn back on, um, and what kind of lead time and ramp up time would you need to do that? Um, is that you know because it seems to me you're in a you're in a particular situation where I mean the festivals at least know it's a go or no go but um, and you know I think that's probably why a number of them saw that it was just not worth the risk of, yeah. of spending money that they we're not going to be able to get back. You're in a harder place to know that. So what? Well, how do you imagine yeah. dealing with that question? Yeah, that's true. If you have a one big event a year, you can rip off the band aid and say, "Well, we're going to live to yeah. you know, fringe fest another day." Yeah. And and but that's just like death by a thousand paper cuts. So what we are doing is like a rolling forecast, um, financially and programming wise. Our commitments are to the two shows that got postponed because we have a big investment in them because they're amazing right. shows and we can put them on quickly. So. At the further along we go, the more things get knocked off and into the following season. Um, so we're develop, building all those contingencies. We're also thinking about how do we take smaller shows and put them into a bigger venue to take into account social distancing. How do we all of those? How do we have to alter actually our two theaters? And we're thinking. Sorry, my the Amazon guy clearly is on the street somewhere. And my dog is barking. But um, we're also thinking about how do we even have the ability with smaller audiences and smaller revenue and the economic barriers to be able to invite and produce the kind of shows that we have been fostering over the last few years in terms of going to you know like building something with a new york producer to go to new york so yeah. it's a we have to change even some of our approach for a period of time um because that it's a huge impact so for us it's a constant shell game of moving things around uh, it's it's like Tetris and we've got co-production partners. So then we're talking to our part friends in Vancouver or in Manitoba or in Toronto. It's very, very complicated. Um, and in some ways we're very blessed because we have the ability to bring things up, you know, in, in a few weeks time. But it's also more challenging because if we could just pick up our whole season and move it a year like Dorothy's house, that might be easier because then you can just say, OK, yeah. we know what's happening. But it's we're, we're still so hopeful. It's the so you could, you, so interestingly enough, you could pull the trigger on those on those two shows you postponed fairly quickly. You probably need what in mm -hmm. a couple of weeks of re-rehearsal, but the costumes are ready to go, the sets are ready to go, everything's set up and ready to go, right? So, so yeah, for one of them for Garno Block, we could. could go, yeah, you could go back into production, assuming everybody's available. You could go back. Yeah. you could ramp up fairly quickly. It's what happens yeah. after that that gets tricky. Okay, yeah. that's helpful to know. Thanks. 
Any other redirects, uh, councillors or the mayor? Uh, just uh, just one thing that may or may not be widely known, but I just wanted to thank Chantel because she stepped up uh, in some of the restructuring we've been doing at um, uh, Edmonton Economic Development to really orient that company to be focused on tourism and uh, and conventions. Chantel has also stepped up uh, on top of her considerable duties at the Citadel to be chair of that board. And some of the conversations there are very much around reactivation of tourism and hospitality, which has an overlap with what we've been talking about here, uh, specific to both venues and the strategies to get people out. So just she's plugged into that. I wanted to, to for this group's benefit, say thank you to her in front of everybody uh, for stepping up. Uh, and that I think that that's going to be a really helpful link uh, going forward. So uh, anyway, just just uh, just more of a shout out than anything else. And thanks for thanks for the report. That's really helpful context and good questions, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Hamilton, Councillor McKean. No. Okay, so oh, Councillor McKean has just turned on. Well, I just I noticed that there was some reference to mental health uh, and some ideas around that, and maybe working with you and Sanjay and my office. Um, I'm on the city's city council's mental health and urban isolation initiative so there might be uh something we could do there to offer some sort of um uh conference video conference on that but i would leave that i think to the arts council to see if that this is the time for that but be very uh very in interested in stepping up on that if that would be a help right now i know we got Financial health issues are, are top of mind today, but uh, along with that comes a lot of stress and strain on people. So um, if I could be of assistance on that, please uh, know that I'd be happy to help. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that. Um, I have... Um... I've been following a bunch of the chat uh, lines here. There are um, a lot of common threads that are coming out that I think are going to inform our conversations going forward rather than maybe in the next sort of seven minutes before we're finished. But I, I think one of the things that has come up is a few questions about other layers of government and things that are happening in other cities. Um, I can report to this group that uh, Sanjay and I have had a standing meeting uh, for an hour a week with our colleagues at the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, um, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, Calgary Arts Development, and, and a few others, the, the community foundations, where you know we get together to chat um, weekly and to sort of share approaches of what seems to be working, what seems to not be working, what things are not clear. Um, I'm not going to suggest that that leads to all the answers, but it does mean that let, at least we're trying to be uh, informed with each other as best as we can. Um, the uh, One of the things that came through on a private uh, uh, message to me here, I think is worth repeating for the group too, that we've, we've really only been talking about audiences to this point, and that's going to be different for every kind of art form. Um, uh, but even if we can get audiences into the hall, the next big, the next question for me is whether or not the artists are able to gather and maintain those physical distancing questions um, you know, for performance or for uh, for presentation. So uh, those are interesting questions to be had. Um, the the last question that I'll sort of put forward here, if the councillors or mayor want to discuss here, uh, this came up on Friday as well, is what role the uh, what role the city may have in helping us um, keep those lines of communications and discussion with the other levels of government open, um, and uh, and ensuring that those uh, those concerns are are echoed not only by the grassroots advocacy of our community and by the administrative discussions that we have, but also at the political level from, from where you folks sit. Well, if I may, um, I think that's a great question. And uh, to the extent we can be asking for similar things or the same things, 
Uh, we've been working to rally that at the regional scale, working to rally that among Alberta municipalities and working to rally that among Canada's big cities uh, through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And uh, um, so I'm on a call, just, just as many of us are on calls with different organizations comparing notes. Uh, I talk to the mayors of the big cities um, about once a week and, and we've been having uh, different uh, engagements with the federal government um, as well. And uh, I think as part of recovery planning, clearly uh, both as organizations, your feedback to us about the gaps in the relief programs um, gives us an opportunity to, to share feedback uh, to the order of government administering that program, which has been mostly the Fed so far. Um, though clearly, I think uh, AFA and EAC will have either partner implementation roles with bigger federal programs uh, or, or sort of bottom-up opportunities. But I, I think the point about alignment um, for advocacy is, is really well taken. I think we'd lean on EAC uh, to a degree from the city. Um, uh, which uh, has a lot of those relationships, um, but then also to take advice uh, and feedback from engagements like this to inform the top level advocacy uh, about, again, gaps in programs for organizations like we've heard today um, and for artists in particular. And I'm certainly willing to take that up uh, in our conversations with senior orders of government. Um, again, we're our, our priority is our own organization at, at present because we're frankly also in some crisis mode too. But but as community leaders, uh, especially as we move into recovery and relaunch here, um, again, what I said at the beginning is we don't want to lose uh, the cultural capacity of the city, which is one of the things that sets it apart and is one of the things that makes life worth worth living here. Absolutely. So um, so we need your advice and guidance, and and I really appreciate that question. Okay, um, we're theoretically coming near the end here, but I understand that perhaps uh, we can extend for an extra couple of minutes um, if there's a nod or not on our politician side. Yes, um, the uh, so there's one uh, note in here about uh, the uh, francophone community that is uh, organizing nationally. To, uh, to talk about uh, various cultural community perspectives. Um, if anybody knows of other national communities like that, perhaps you can put them in the chat. Uh, and we've got one of our festival, smaller festival organizers asking about the city's support for creative ways to hold events this year. Um, certainly from the Arts Council's perspective, if you've received a grant to put on an event this year, we've said out loud that we're being very flexible in terms of how that happens. Um, we are going to have ongoing conversations. Um, is there any uh, internal work at the city at this point about external outside events that you might be able to communicate? Is there, uh, I understand that the uh, outdoor events have certainly been suspended to the end of this summer. Is that correct from everybody's understanding? Uh, that's a, that was a provincial that was a provincial decision yeah the issue is yeah. the issue of the mass gathering restrictions um on on assembly of large numbers of people even outside um and and the the way it's written is still fairly restrictive whether those will ease and on what basis they might be eased um time will tell so I think I think the upshot of that is that it's really infeasible to have any sort of mass gathering or plan for one in the foreseeable future. Um, so that that has meant that just about every organization has has cancelled out to the end of summer at this point, or even for outdoor. Right. Um, and uh, Sherry has brought up a, a point in the chat, uh, Sherry Somerville. Um, it, uh, it's it's uh, it's fabulous to hear from the federal government that there's uh, um, directed support for sports and culture, um, and her uh, echoing our community's concerns about diversification of those dollars that ensure that they come to this part of the country, um, which has been a, a challenge in the past on occasion. Uh, so I'll put that out just for a for a quick comment before we think about uh, final final words here yeah i i mean i i think the real challenge is you know i think the feds are going to be there in some form i think they've already stepped up i think they understand the challenge to the sector 
Um, I have I have no idea where the province is at. I don't think anybody does. Um, and that's that's going to be the more inter interesting part of the discussion. And I would just add to that one of the things that I'm hearing, and I you know, and I think it'll, this is an interesting discussion we need to have. It's it's one thing to say that groups can hold on to the money for this year, even if they're not producing. I think the challenge, and we have this has to be pushed out to the to the to both other orders of governments as well. We need to look at it also is going way back to the beginning. How do you begin to adjudicate next year's money based on this year's inactivity? And I, you know, and I, I would argue that what we need to be looking at is actually not doing what we would usually do, and actually probably going back to previous years so that people don't have to worry that their next year's money will be jeopardized by what's happening right now. And that's probably something we need to start pushing for. I would agree with that. I think the best way for us to be truly brave, creative, and think outside the box is not to be worried about whether our funding models and our formulas will be um, legitimate, and so that we can be free for this year to to do what we need to do to thrive. And that includes a whole other co a conversation about cross-cultural collaborations that we can have internally in our sector with each other. I, I was just going to say, I saw John mention in the chat that, uh, that we've historically been underfunded by Canada Council, and I think this is yet another time to go back and advocate to Canada Council on, on exactly what I think a lot of you are talking about, which is that we get um, a, a fair allocation of resources. I also want to note that on top of the COVID issue, um, Alberta hadn't had time to deal with the um, the fall in oil prices on which the budget is predicated and we've been waiting for a federal um, program to assist that part of the economy as oil prices if you're watching have been sort of all over the map um, so i think i i really hate using the word opportunity because for a lot of people this is not an opportunity but it it does make some of those things that we've been um, talking about for years in terms of fairness uh, and reevaluating how fun federal funding comes to this province uh, more prescient. So I do note uh, that we are now a little bit over time. I think uh, um, I certainly want to thank Julian Main from Arts Habitat, who's contributed also in the chat um, about the, his work uh, to talk um, with, the, with the federal side. Uh, and as regards future operating funding, certainly all of you who have who have been part of that structure with the EAC know that we were in the process of building that new structure uh, for 2021 and beyond. Um, we were very pleased to be able to have a simplified process for 2020, and we're in the we were at the front end of that conversation um, as all of these restrictions came on to us. Uh, I can see no reason that we wouldn't continue those conversations now um, and try and figure out the best way forward in conjunction with our community, which is the way that we want to do it. Uh, so um, I will perhaps offer Sanjay a moment to just say anything that he wants to wrap up with, and then perhaps the mayor can have a moment, and then we will we will adjourn. Sanjay, did you want to say anything else? Yes, thank you, Stephen. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's important that uh, uh, the community uh, has the reassurance that we have been uh, working quite hard. And uh, Stephen just mentioned uh, about how we ran the operating um, uh, program for, for 2020. I just want to say that I think uh, we fully understand that the community is an active ecology, that there is there are, you know, at the best of times, there are many, um, many different, many different perspectives that actually make the ecology so uh, strong and so um, compelling. And so, the one-size-fits-all solution is not something that we have taken, um, you know, as something that we will do. Uh, we are very focused on, uh, on both the, the structures or the organizations that actually allow us to have that diversity in our ecology, but we're also very focused on the individual artists. And so we have responded, um, uh, you know, to the to the need in the community um, for, in, for individuals um, as of now, because we recognize that 
uh, so many of the opportunities either have completely dried up or uh, artists need to have to make a change in how they think about their their future work and so uh, focusing focusing on on uh, giving artists the time to do their creation i think has been one of our responses but uh, from an organizational standpoint uh, you know we are we are in discussions uh, we do have uh, community members who are who are uh, uh, you know advising us um, uh, on on a board committee and uh, one of the things we will look at is how we can work together i think it was sherry or somebody else who suggested that this is a this is a really great time for us to come together as a community and, and try and build something that is not just uh, that's not just uh, uh, available for the next 12 to 18 months, but how do we reimagine after we recover and relaunch? How do we reimagine uh, the work that we do so that we can actually do what the city uh, so so uh, clearly wants us to do? We can come out of this in a way that um, you know that actually is uh, you know aligned with where the city is going. So with that. I, I just want to reassure people that that uh, the EAC is um, is is working hard to make sure that um, we we have a resilient community. Okay, uh, and last word I think to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, before we adjourn. Well, just uh, again, thanks to my colleagues. Uh, I know uh, through their initiatives and, and through their their lives, they're connect all of them connected to the arts, and I appreciate uh, uh, them bringing their perspectives. And they're each embedded on uh, some new uh, working committees that we've set up um, that that will benefit from the information that uh, you've provided today about some of the gaps for the sector. And I really hear the points about keeping the artists and the talent. Um, intact and thriving uh, through this as a resource uh, about the challenges with venues and and costs uh, about uh, the issue of equity uh, which will follow up on uh, coordinated advocacy on equity for the uh, for the relief funding and go forward i think there's still a historic issue there so this has all been very very helpful and i'm, I'm grateful to each of you for your time and your leadership uh, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, Stephen for moderating, to Sanjay for uh, organizing on behalf of the Arts Council. Thank you all uh, for your work. Very well. I, I think we can potentially take a, a, um, a an idea that our uh, that our uh, ASL colleagues, our deaf colleagues, use uh, in that we can't really offer real applause, but we can. We can offer this kind of applause. And um, thank you to all of you for being here. I'm terribly sorry that I was unable to see all of your faces for the entire meeting. So before you uh, sign off, I'd be most grateful if you would uh, if you would show your face to me one more time, just for my mental health, if nothing else. And um, and uh, we are adjourned until such time as we can meet again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.